We're going to talk about where veterinary behavioural medicine, where does it fit into ARH? And today it will be myself and my resident, uh, Dr Andrew O'Shea, doing the presentation. So I love this slide. Once upon a time, where were we? Um, well, that's how behavioural medicine started. Originally, it was all about animal behaviour. It was all like fairy tales. And a lot of it was woolly woofty stuff. That's how people perceive what I do as being something that's light, it's easy, anyone can do it, and everybody's an expe expert in behaviour. But that's really not the way it actually is. So I titled it Ettinger, Lacuda, Buffington and Ogilvy and they all decided that knowing about behaviour actually changed the way they practice. And what was fascinating for me yesterday, I asked my students, who are Ettinger, Lacuda, Buffington and Ogilvy? And they had no idea. So I'm assuming that some of, your, some of you in the audience have no idea who these people are. You know who they are? Yes, they actually wrote, they are the world leaders in internal medicine. Rick Lacoud is an Australian who's a neurologist, Tony Buffington. Um, Tony Buffington is, uh, Ogilvy is, uh, is oncology and Tony Buffington knows all about renal problems in animals. And they've done a lot of research in behaviour and knowing about how behaviour works has changed the way they practice medicine. So it's a worldwide thing, a trend that's happening now. Marty Becker is coming out to Australia shortly and, and Marty Becker is uh, America's veterinarian and he's really into practice management and he started a fear-free panel, how veterinary hospitals actually have to be fear-free places. And if you look at um, what's happened with dentistry and some of us would remember going to the dentist years ago and it was really a you know, the noise of the drills and everything was really traumatic. Now dentistry has changed and people, the young kids who are growing up now have no fear of the dentist, whereas my age, dentistry was always really kind of scary. And this is a really big trend that's happening. I'm um, very privileged to be part of the Fear Free panel and, um, that's happening in, um, in America and it's now going to Europe and it's coming to Australia. And it's all about handling animals in a hospital in a Fear Free way to make it safer for the animals, safer for um, the people that work with them. So I think we're finally getting on the crux where behavioural medicine is now at the tip of the iceberg rather than something that nobody wants to know about. Um, and that's why I said, do you know who they are? And it's good that one person in the audience knows, but uh, it's interesting. One of the students said to me, oh, I don't care who writes the textbooks. And I said, well, you should care who writes the textbooks because if they don't do peer-reviewed research, then actually, how do you know what you're getting? And those of you who might consider doing my postgraduate course will know I actually put a chapter in there that everybody says, oh, my God, I can't believe this. It's just so old-fashioned. And yet it's written by someone who is an expert, who has a doctor title um, because he's a PhD, but nothing about behaviour. And everything he's written is actually fairly recent, but incredibly, incredibly outdated and incredibly not what we need to do. And why should that matter? Well, if the experts in the field of internal medicine... Um, neurology and oncology and other fields think that behaviour is really important for what they do, then I think it's time that ARH thinks about that as well. So where does veterinary behavioural medicine fit into ARH? Well, free free hospitals, I've talked about that, about Marty Becker. Um, it fits into internal medicine, it uh, fits into surgery pre-op, what you should be doing. It fits into surgery post-op, what you should be doing there. It fits into orthopaedics, neurology, oncology, etc. You pick what specialty is and I'll tell you how we can help the patients and how we can help you and how referrals backwards and forwards are really important. So how can we help? We talk about behaviour um, and we talk about the things that cause behaviour, genetics, learning and environment and what we do, how do we treat them is what I call the three M's. We manage the environment, we teach about behaviour modification and we talk about medication and I'm quickly going to run through some of that and then hand over to Andrew for some specific cases. Environmental management, um, what we're talking about is giving the animal physical stimulation as well as mental stimulation in a way that we can manage the animal properly. And I know we get a lot of uh, cases and I guess I see them after they've had surgery done, maybe six months. We had a case the other day that the dog had been told by the surgeon it's not allowed to move, you've got to crate it, and the puppy just went basically nuts in the cage, couldn't, they couldn't keep it quiet, the surgery broke down, all sorts of things happened and so we had to treat it and yet if we'd been referred the case before it left the hospital we would have, could have given that owner a lot better information and she wouldn't have had to pay for the surgery twice. We talked about calm on cue and that is the most important thing is to actually teach the animals to be calm and medication, I'm going to just quickly step on what's, uh, mention what's appropriate and what's not appropriate as medications are. 
So medications that I think are appropriate that we should be thinking about um, and in every part of the hospital I hope that you've got pheromone diffusers. I'm assuming you've got um, Feliway and uh, Daptil and that you use not only in the cages but you actually perfume. You've been to my lectures before, I know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. So you've got everybody organised. But what we also need to think about is trazodone as a pre-med. Um, uh, there's a few papers now looking at it as using it as a pre-med prior to surgery so that the animal is nice and calm and as a post-op medication as well because their recovery is much, much smoother um, if we use trazodone. Certainly the surgeons and the anaesthetists in the veterinary field in America use it commonly now and it's starting to be used in general practice but I... Not really sure what ARH is doing, is using it as a pre-med or a post-op. Clonidine is really another medication that is used to stop that um, arousal that we get in animals when they get really upset about things. Um, Buspirone is something that we could be using as a short-term medication. And some of these animals, and Andrew's going to touch on them, we're using fluoxetine, sertraline, peroxetine, SSRIs might be a really good thing um, uh, to help them get through what's happening with the surgery. So what you shouldn't be using is ACP. There should be no place as ACP. Um, I see a lot of veterinarians uh, prescribe it to keep animals quiet after surgery. And what we know, it, it, there's no anxiolytic properties. It makes them more noise sensitive, so they actually have more issues afterwards. Venobarbital is an inappropriate medication unless they've got seizures. And MPA or any of the estrogen uh, medications are certainly not appropriate um, to help animals calm. Okay, we talk about the traffic light system a lot um, and it's all about behaviour and arousal and I think this is one of the things that we're going to get Andrew to talk about, um, that what you really want when you've got your patients is to have them in the green zone, nice, calm, relaxed, where they can think, remember and learn. When they come to a veterinary hospital generally, they're in their yellow or orange zone already, so you don't want them going to the red zone and the way you handle these animals We'll take them out of the, we'll either put them back in the calm zone or you'll end up with an animal that's really distressed, anxious and is likely to bite you. What you'll notice is when you've got an animal in green, that's the time you want to proceed. You want to keep doing things with them because the animal is really calm and relaxed and it can learn that things are really nice. Um, when you look at the other, when you get into the orange zone, it means you've got to slow down. Okay, you don't actually want to be handling that animal. You want to be slowing down, really looking at its body language, what it's doing. And if it's a red zone, um, stop. And you know they're in the red zone when you've got the flight and fight response, when they really just want to get away. Um, and sometimes what we think of as being a calm animal is a sleeping animal. That animal is actually shut down and it's not, not able to do stuff. So veterinarians often assume that the animals are really calm and the cage is the really calm and relaxed animal and they're not. So... Um, I need to stop what I'm doing, so if it's in the red zone, stop. I need to slow down is when you see them in the orange and I'm doing great, that's what you've got to think about when they're in that green zone. So just to remember, um, or remind you I guess, when you see fearful animals, we talk about the four Fs, we talk about the flight, fight, freeze and fiddle and all of them mean that the animal is upset. So the dog that's lip licking, yawning, stretching, scratching is actually fiddling and that is a dog that's also fearful and upset. And the same thing applies to cats. People often forget that cats um, uh, show these behaviours but we look at lip licking and yawning in cats and forget that they're actually quite frightened. And now I'm going to hand over to Andrew who's fixed up the slides. Um, I'm Andrew. I'm Kirsty's new resident. My baby. I'm the baby resident. So. <laughs> so I approach this from a slightly different angle and maybe it goes back to the fact that I still do a, a little bit of, of uh, general practice. And I thought, you know, the topic is, you know, how we can utilise behaviour to help um, provide the best care. Okay? So... First, uh, first of all, I started to think about... Um, what are the behavioural abnormalities behind the disease? And you work in emergency, etc., etc. How many of those dogs coming into you that have been hit by a car, gone through plate windows, it's things like that, that have got an underlying behavioural abnormality like separation anxiety? How many of them come in during thunderstorms with the phobias? How many of the surgeons remove foreign bodies from animals without sort of thinking about, hey, maybe this dog has an abnormal repetitive behaviour ingesting 
socks. And I had one Labrador that was presented each month for four months that was eating satin knickers. Okay? And uh, no matter how much I spoke to the client about we needed to sort out the behaviour of the, of the animal, they were looking at, no, we just have to stop the daughter from leaving her knickers around the place. So how many of the cranial cruciate ligament ruptures that we deal with are, are caused by the dog panicking? I certainly have had one of my nurses who recently had a dog, um, I think it was operated on here, and it ruptured its cranial cruciate ligament during a thunderstorm when it was panicking. How many of the diabetics that we deal with, you cannot balance them in hospital because they've got an anxiety disorder and they've got excess cortisol levels? And, of course, the excess cortisol levels certainly increase the frequencies of cancers. So th those behavioural issues are behind literally every disease we deal with because the animals behave. So all of the animals in hospital are, are going to be scared. One in five of them will have an anxiety disorder. So we need to look after them, and, and we're meant to be veterinarians, and we are meant to be not doing any harm to the patients. So if we're not looking after these animals as far as their anxieties are concerned, as far as their fears are concerned, I don't think we're providing the animals with the best care that we can do. Marty Becker, he's here this weekend associated with the, um, the Australian Veterinary Association Practice Management course and he's giving lectures in Sydney on fear free practice. And he's putting it forward that not only is it best medicine, it's actually best, med uh, best business in the sense that you lose clients because they don't want to come back to your hospital because the animal is scared. So if we can teach these animals over a generation maybe of animals that they don't have to be scared coming into a veterinary practice, we're going to get more business, we're going to get happier animals, and I think we will be happier too because our jobs will be um, less stressful. I think they'll also be safer because if we're not dealing with the anxious animals anymore, the number of bites and scratches and so forth for us are going to reduce. Um, and... Kirsty most probably can make some comments on this, but I have certainly seen a number of animals after be going through a large procedure in a veterinary hospital seem to almost be suffering from a post-traumatic stress type disorder because of the uh, fear and so forth that that animal suffered over an extended period of time. So I think we do need to look at what the animals are going through when they're in our hospitals. Um, the traffic light system that we were talking about, at Sydney Uni we're dealing with them. Um, we're looking at the animals and trying to get the students to identify what colour they're in emotionally versus their body language. And initially it was suggested that we should be teaching the students to recognise the animals going into the red zone. I've actually told them that that's too late. We need to identify the animals in the yellow zone when they are doing those fiddling behaviours, when they are showing those displacement behaviours and the freezing behaviours, we need to identify those animals, back off, help those animals calm down into the green zone and then proceed. And that's the attitude we're taking at Sydney Uni at the moment. So, um, How many of the animals are not recovering from our medical procedures and our surgical procedures because of behavioural abnormalities. And Kirsty gave the example that the dog had to have two lots of surgery, it was confined to a cage, and behaviourally it did not cope with that cage. I think we've got a lot of animals that do need good rest to recover. And if we're not teaching those animals how to cope with living in a cage for a period of time, how to teach the owners to keep the animals calm, teach the animals to calm on cue, I think we're going to have problems. And I use a, a, a reasonable amount of, of medications on these dogs to try and help them keep calm. Because if we don't do that, they're going to rip sutures open. If you have a dog that's stabilised with diabetes, it goes home and it has panic attacks and so forth, it's insulin and glucose is going to be all over the place. So the stress is a really big component to it. And it's interesting to look at the definitions of stress. 
Some definitions are as simple as anything that ri raises the cortisol level, which means any fear that we're dealing with, any anxieties that we're dealing with. And we get a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of abnormal repetitive behaviours or what we might call obsessive compulsive disorders. And if the animal is obsessive and compulsive about the base of his tail and you've just done surgery near the base of his tail, you're going to have problems with that. I have a dog that's got an abnormal repetitive behaviour and he chases his tail or, or spins. And the reality is that dog doesn't like being patted because he's had a chronic skin condition since he was a very small dog. He loves massaging, but he hates being touched. So um, how many of these dogs are recovering from ear surgeries or, or particular surgeries and some of the attention they're paying to those wounds is almost a, an abnormal repetitive behaviour rather than the dogs just looking at the wound. We also know there are lots of links between diseases and behavioural abnormalities. So we know that there's a strong link. Th these are just notes that I threw up this morning. Um, and we know that there's a link between anxieties and skin. And when you consider that um, about 95% of the serotonin in our body is in the gut and the skin, it's most probably not unusual to expect that animals that have anxieties are most probably going to be suffering from skin problems and gastrointestinal problems. The problem with the repetitive behaviours and pain, and you know the old answer to dealing with a dog with a, with a problem chasing its tail was to cut the tail off. It didn't solve the problem. So we get a lot of, of people sort of thinking that that solves the problem, but it doesn't. And have those animals got phantom pains and so forth, we need to be aware of those. And again, the repetitive behaviours and gastrointestinal disease, there are some links between oral stereotypies and gastrointestinal irritation, so we need to be aware of those. So we need people to be thinking outside of their square. Um, most of the actual abnormal behaviours where the animal is spinning for 24 hours. I think we are really good at recognising those, but if the animal only spins once, should we be doing something about that animal? So I think most vets can recognise the really intense, severe, abnormal behaviours, but are they recognising the, the contributing component of those behaviours to other medical conditions that they're dealing with? So.